Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath to all. How are you guys today? You know, I normally, just uh, to let you in on on a little uh, perspective I have, I normally despise it when we talk about church giving and we talk about our local church budget and we say things like, it pays for the heating and the air conditioning. That normally makes me just, oh, I just have this visceral reaction because I think our church does much more than just keep ourselves hot and cool, right? Right? We support ministries, we support Christian education, we um, help facilitate people having meals to eat, we help facilitate people coming to know Jesus through Bible study and through the gospel. So we do all these things, and so, so when we talk about church budget, I, I want to highlight those things because I think, man, air conditioning and heat, it's not that compelling. But on a day like this, just want to let you know our offering today will go toward local church budget. And doesn't it feel nice in here? I'm glad that you're here with us, those of you that worship here regularly. And for those of you that are here for your first time, we just want to welcome you in a special way. We're in the midst of a series that we've been doing for, for many weeks. And right now we're kind of in, in the midst of a mini-series within that series where we're talking about the book of Romans. It's a New Testament book. And it's really been a central book throughout the history of Christians as they've come to understand what it is that Jesus means to them. And so last week we, we dove into that book and we, we attempted to go through about the first eight chapters, just talking about major themes that are there. We'll revisit that a little bit this morning. Uh, but what we're going to try to do for the rest of the morning then is to finish out and paint the big picture. We won't get into all the nitty gritty, but we're trying to paint the big picture of what the Apostle Paul, someone who came to be convinced that Jesus was the Son of God and that in his life and death, Jesus had somehow accomplished something that was setting the world right with God again. And so then this this book, this letter then, is a description of, of how Paul says that happens and what that looks like and what that means for us. So in order to unpack that, though, I think it's important for us to start by laying a bit of a, of a foundation, because the message of the good news that's found in Romans, what we call the gospel message, uh, it literally means good news, in order to understand what the, what the good news is all about, we have to understand kind of the bigger picture of what's happening and what makes the good news good news. Uh, to give you just a, a quick little illustration, if I said to you that the Golden State Warriors won game one of the finals. That is news to some of you, but whether or not it's good news depends on the context in which it's framed, right? So whether or not that's good news has to do with what side of the country you grew up on, uh, what sports teams your your parents were involved in, And, and for some of you, it's just not really good or bad news. You just don't care. But the thing is, that data, that message is news, And what makes it good news is the context in which you receive it. And so the New Testament then is about announcing something. It's about proclaiming news. It's about proclaiming something that Jesus has done. But whether or not that is good news has to do with the the context in which you hear that news. And so in order to to get into this, I I want to unpack that context just a little bit. See if I can... All right. Now, in order to really get into this, we have to understand a central teaching of Scripture, something we call covenant. And covenant is a a word that we don't use as much now. Uh, We tend to use a word like contract. But the idea behind covenant is that there are parties that are coming together into a relationship, and that relationship has guidelines or it has a code that the parties who are coming into covenant will live by and abide by. Uh, probably one of the most uh, easy to cite examples of covenant that, that rings true for today. Uh, we've got some friends here. I, I, I want to make you guys stand, but I don't want to embarrass you unnecessarily. But um, Chantel and I have some great friends, John and Sarah, and they're visiting with us today. And uh, they're about to enter into a covenant. Can you say amen to that? They are starting a business together. No, it's not that kind of covenant. They're going to be married this summer. You say amen? That's awesome. Yeah. So they're, they're coming together in covenant. And so this is an arrangement where two parties are coming together, two parties that have been separate. But now they're saying, we're going to bind ourselves together in relationship. 
And every covenant, every marriage, every relationship that's, that's sort of structured in this way, on the outset may appear to just be all about the covenant itself, right? It's just about the relationship. When, when you fell in love with the person that you were to marry, if, if you eventually got married, uh, you know, there may have been a time when, when kind of all you thought about was just wanting to be in the presence of the one that you loved. But as you soon find out, the covenant, the relationship, also has other strands of thought that, that define what that relationship is really all about. For many of you, this, this might be the case. I would assume it's been the case for me. You get married and you think, okay, I'm joining myself to a person. But then you realize, oh, I didn't just marry a person. I married a family, right? And so now that covenant has elements of family to it, that, that you're navigating that. There are elements of, uh, of household structuring and child rearing. And, and all of these things then are are things that flow out of this relationship. Your life has been changed because you've come together in covenant and now there are these different elements that are now transformed. It transforms uh, how you put your, the toilet paper on, right? Some of you want the toilet paper to, to go down. Some of you want it to be on the backside and, and that's been a source of tension maybe for you. Some of you, the covenant of marriage has resulted in you having to learn how to fold underwear and socks in a different way. And for some of you, it's involved just having to learn how to fold things for the first time. <laughs> so the baseline then is that Scripture is teaching that God has entered into covenant with humanity from the outset. And he created humanity to live in relationship with himself, to, relive, to live in covenant with him. And in the same way that, that covenants that we have with the ones we love or with our children or, or even with business associates... That's lived out, that covenant is lived out in specific areas and specific ways. In that same way, the covenant that God has entered into with humanity from the very get-go is lived out in some specific ways, some specific emphases, and these become central points that Scripture uses in order to talk about what it means for humanity to have a covenant relationship with God, what it means for this distance, like we talked about, between God and humanity to be brought together when we're connected with God. These are three consistent areas that the Scriptures use in order to identify and, and flesh out what that covenant means. I want to put these up, and, and you'll, you might be a little bit surprised by some of these, but we'll try to demonstrate that this is really something that's central to Scripture. It's not just a, a tangent. So the first one of these is that there's, there's um, a way in which people will now relate to land because of the, the covenant they have with God. So being connected with God then means being connected with land in a new and significant way. The second strand that's, that's really prominent is when you're connected with God, then you find yourself as part of a family. There's a community now. And then the third strand that's really significant for us is the idea of blessing. And the, the primary notion behind this is that when we find ourselves in covenant relationship with God, we receive blessings from Him, but we're to be conduits of blessing, and, and that blessing then flows out to those around us. And so these three strands, land, family, and blessing, give us a tangible expression of what it looks like when a covenant relationship with God is lived out. Does that make sense? No. These three strands give us clarity about what it actually looks like when we say, I have a relationship with God. These are three consistent ways in which that relationship with God is expressed. Now, in order to, to kind of get at the heart of that, I want to go into the scripture to the very original account of God creating humanity for relationship with himself. And we're going to see these three strands come to the forefront from the very outset. This is God's uh, beginning design for humanity. So in Genesis 126, God said, let us make man or humanity in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them. It's our third strand, this idea of blessing. God blessed them and God said to them, 
be fruitful and what? Multiply. Now, when two people come together in covenant and then they multiply, what do we call that group? Family. Yeah, so they find themselves as part of family. So, so God has, has blessed them, and then God places them within family. He gives Adam to Eve. He gives Eve to Adam, and eventually they'll have children. So as part of this covenant relationship with God, they find themselves as recipients of blessing, and they find themselves as part of a family. He goes on and he says, Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We go down to verse 29. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the what? Earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And so we, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to every thing that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And so we have here this, this beginning intimation then of blessing, of family, and then even here there's a, there's a definition, there's an expression now of how these two that are living in covenant with God, Adam and Eve, as they're living in relationship with God, what that means for the land around them. And it even extends to the fish and to the animals. This is more explicitly spelled out in Genesis chapter 2. It says, The Lord God planted a what? A garden toward the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. In verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him where? Into the garden of Eden to cultivate it. And keep it. Many of you have your garden now in the ground. Uh, Life is beginning to emerge from the soil. And this is the original context in which God places the first pair, the first human family. They're living in covenant with God. So they find themselves as recipients of blessing. And they find themselves uh, as part of a family. And now, don't miss the significance of this. They find themselves in a particular land. And that land is entrusted to them. They're supposed to be caretakers of this land. And that land even extends to the, to the animals that are around them. They're, they're to name the creatures. They're supposed to take care of them. They're supposed to be friends with them. And in verse 15 there that we still have on the screen, it says that God places Adam into this garden to cultivate it and to keep it. And the word there for keep it is actually giving us the the idea of protecting it. So it's as if God says, okay, we're in covenant, so this is your family, you're recipients of blessing, share that blessing amongst yourselves and and on throughout the earth, and then this land is yours to take care of. Now, not surprisingly, when humanity chooses to reject this covenant relationship and basically says, hey God, this is nice, but we're done with you, that covenant relationship is fractured But the fracturing takes place also in all three levels that we're looking at. It it creates a fracturing in humanity's relationship with family. It makes a fracture in humanity's relationship to blessings and how we relate to the blessings that God gives. And it creates a fracture. It creates a new situation for how humanity relates to land. And this is really not that um, surprising, right? Because many of us have, have seen firsthand what it means when people come together in covenant relationship and how they live together in covenant relationship. And then we've seen the aftermath and we've experienced the aftermath of when that covenant relationship is broken, that changes the way in which the relationship has been lived out, right? So we, we, and some of us have found ourselves in situations where we ended up moving out of the house that we lived in because the covenant relationship that we were part of changed, some of us have found ourselves um, with, with new and, and different family because the first covenant relationship has changed. And so now we have new members in the family and, and other people aren't part of the family anymore. And, and the way in which we relate to, to blessings changes. Now, so what we find when humanity originally rejects this covenant relationship, the family fractures, husband and wife begin to blame each other. When they reject relationship with God, they begin to distance themselves from each other. They begin to to be selfish in how they relate to the blessings of God. 
so that Adam and Eve, who were created to pass blessing to all humanity throughout time, end up passing on curse to all humanity throughout time. They were given the blessing of God to share with all of us, but instead we inherited a bunch of problems from them, right? And then Adam and Eve were meant to experience the covenant of God in the context of this garden that God has planted, but when they choose to reject that covenant, they are removed from the land. Does that make sense? So we see these three strands, land, family, blessing. When the covenant's in place, these three strands are always expressing the beauty of that covenant. And when the covenant is fractured, we see the brokenness in these three strands. Now, as we've pointed out in, in, in many times, the Bible begins by telling us the story of how God intended for all of us to live in perfect relationship with God and what that would look like. And, it be, and then it tells the story of how that relationship and that ideal was broken. And the story of Scripture... This is fascinating. It quickly moves and it begins to tell the story of one man and his family, a man by the name of Abram or Abraham. If you're not from a a Christian context, he may be unfamiliar. You may have heard some singing, some song about Father Abraham having a bunch of kids. That may have been confusing. Uh, but, But Abraham then is this figurehead within Scripture for both Jews and for Christians And the whole point of Abraham isn't just that he's an example of someone that had a relationship with God. It's that in the story of Abraham, God is fixing all the brokenness of humanity. He's restoring covenant with humanity. And that covenant, when it's restored, is going to impact how Abraham relates to land. It's going to impact how Abraham relates to family. And it's going to impact how Abraham relates to blessing. And I want to show you this. This is just powerful. This is when God first appears to this man, Abram. Remember, Abram is living in in one of the ancient Near Eastern cultures, in a culture in which family lines would have lived together generationally. And so he's rooted in this community, and he finds himself as part of a family where he's been there for as long as he's lived, and his, his fathers live with him, and his father's father lives with him. And so he's part of this communal structure, but God appears to him, and, it's, and this is just absolutely fascinating. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, your land, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. So, so I'm, I'm entering into covenant with you, and so this is going to change the very land that you experience, the very land that you relate to. You're going to move. He also says that you're going to leave your family. Notice what he says. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you will be a what? A blessing. So Abraham's whole world is being rearranged, and God is, is reconnecting with humanity, entering into covenant with humanity, and as Abraham experiences it, it involves Abraham changing his land. It involves Abraham having a new family, And we find out later on in the story that this means that Abraham is going to have a son as a very old man. And and I know for many of you that would be a great curse. But for Abraham, that was a great blessing. You know, the the last... Some of you, if if you heard today, you are pregnant, that would just finish you off. That would be... Can't take any more. And then also, Abraham is going to be a blessing. And notice how God says this in verse 3. He says, I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And notice this final line. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is the intent that God has when he creates humanity from the very get-go. I'm going to put you in a garden. You're going to have a family. And you're going to be a source of blessing to all humanity. And so now when God is trying to reconnect with humanity, when he's restoring this covenant, these three elements, the land, the family, and the blessing are all wrapped up in it. Now, this might be new and unfamiliar for many of you, even if you've grown up in a Christian context, and you say, hey, what's the big deal? Uh, Here's the big deal. The way in which the New Testament believers are understanding what Jesus has accomplished is all connected with this story. See, oftentimes we, we talk about the gospel, and we condense it down to its very smallest little portion, as, as though we are in a situation in which 
you know, we were on an airliner and it was about to crash and someone turns to us and says, I don't know God, tell me the gospel. And then we give them that like, we have 30 seconds left before you're going to end con- condensation of the gospel. And that is great and that is appropriate. But it's also not the fuller message that, that Paul is speaking of in Romans when he writes. And having this framework in place gives us more clarity to understand why is Paul saying what he's saying? Many people have read Romans and said, who can understand this? But part of the difficulty of understanding is that this is the framework that he's operating from. God is restoring covenant with humanity, and he's fixing the brokenness of the world, and it happens at least on these three levels. Now, what I want to do is um, move to Romans now. And if you have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to open your Bible to the book of Romans. We're going to be spending the rest of our time here. And as you're turning there, I'll just remind you, this is the call that God gave to Abraham that we just looked at. But this call really becomes the charter for the formation of the nation of Israel. So Israel then, they're the descendants of Abraham, and and they're largely called to live out this covenant that God has enacted with Abraham. And so we find the children of Israel, they're part of this family. That's why they're called the children of Israel. Israel. They call themselves the sons of Abraham. So they're, they're a family, and God says, I'll make you a nation of, and a kingdom of priests. And so the idea then is that, that they're supposed to take the blessings of God and pass them on to the rest of the world so that all the world will come to know this awesome, beautiful, faithful God. And, and not surprisingly, in order for this covenant with Israel to be lived out, God leads this nation out of slavery in Egypt and he takes them to the promised land. They experience their covenant with God in the context of a land that's given to them. And so we come now to Romans and I just want to briefly review where we were last week to kind of catch us up on, on what we learned in Romans. Romans is telling the story of God's faithfulness. And really this story is the story that God created humanity and was in covenant with them. And humanity rejected that, but God hasn't given up on humanity. Can you say amen? Like, we've all lived as boneheads. Can you say amen to that? Many of us, not many of us, all of us have made some stupid, foolish decisions, right? You can say amen to that. And you can say that with a little bit more spirit because you know it's true. You know, some of those are very dramatic. Uh, my wife works in the ER occasionally, and, and she tells me, you know, you, you go work on July 4th, and as it gets later in the day, and the alcohol intensity in people's blood increases, the accidents and the, um, the, what we, the uniqueness, the peculiarity of the ac- accident begins to increase, right? As, as people are less and less uh, functional in their minds, they begin to have more and more dramatic accidents, and we can look at that and say, wow, that's foolish, but we could look at our own lives and say, man, we've done things that are just as dumb. But the story of Scripture is that even though we've we've made a mess of our lives, God has not rejected us. God is faithful to us, and he never lets us go. And so last week, we, we went through the first about eight chapters in Romans, looking at these major themes, that all the world is guilty before God. But that in the life, death, and resurrection, Jesus can set us free from our guilt and he sets us free to experience a new life. And this new life, the Apostle Paul says, is a life of resurrection. So this old and broken way of living has been put to death and now there's a new and a living way of relating to the world, of relating to ourselves, of relating to God, of relating to each other. And finally, we saw powerfully that in the context of God's faithfulness, we find from beginning to end, no matter the circumstance that we face, no matter the difficulty that we endure, we are loved by God. And there's nothing that you can do, there's nothing that you have done, there's nothing that you can say, and there's no difficult experience you can go through that that would lessen God's love for you. You are thoroughly loved by Him because of how good He is. And so this is God's faithfulness to us. And that brings us up into about Romans chapter 8, but I want to let you know historically, those of you that are, are students of Scripture, you'll find this interesting. Uh, for those of you that aren't interested, just we'll come back to you in about 30 seconds. But in the history of the interpretation of Romans, 
It's 16 chapters, right? 16 chapters long, this book. Many people have said it's the clearest explanation of the gospel. And then what they've said is that the gospel is presented from chapters 1 through 8. And the rest of it is largely disconnected from the beginning. And you can kind of do without it if you want. That's what many people have said. But that's, that's contrary to, to Paul's whole notion because the idea is by the time we get to chapter 8, this covenant that we've been talking about, this covenant relationship where we're connected to God has been restored in the work of Jesus. So because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you can have a covenant relationship with God. You can live in relationship with Him. And for the rest of the book of Romans then, Paul is largely fleshing out these three areas. He's saying because you have a covenant with God, because you're connected with Him, this is what it looks like. And and so the rest of the book of Romans then is part and parcel of what it means to live as part of God's covenant family. And so to really experience this, what I want to do is just take a a survey, a quick survey of some of the remaining portions of Romans. And I think this is absolutely going to jump out to you. So I'm in Romans chapter 8 now, and verse 14. And what I want to do is to begin moving through Romans, looking at these three strands, this idea of the land, of the family, of the blessing, and see how they're fulfilled now as this new, this new covenant with God is lived out. So I'm in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. If you're there, just go ahead and say amen. All right. Now, in this passage, we're going to find the idea of land and family, and they're just blended up in there. So watch this. Romans 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the what? Sons of God. So that's a familial term. We're, we're part of God's family. We're his children. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of what? Adoption. This is family language. You've been, you've been made part of the family now. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, or Father. And so he's saying, because of this covenant relationship that we have with God through Jesus, that Jesus has been who we never were. Jesus has, has lived a perfect life and he's died in our place so that we don't have to. Because of this, we relate to, to God not just as distant and powerful king, but we relate to him as near and dear father and dad. We're part of his family. We're his children. And then notice how this, this expresses itself. Verse 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so this idea then of, of family and a new family that we're part of comes to the fore strongly. But then notice how he continues on to this idea of land. In verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Of God. Now, what I want to do is just pause there and kind of recap. What's he saying? He's saying when God created humanity and they were in covenant relationship with him, the land was perfect. But when the covenant blew up, the land blew up. So the, the broken covenant between humanity and God resulted in the land itself experiencing sin, experiencing tragedy and brokenness. You know, uh, I told you three weeks ago, I was away from here, and I was reading news reports, and there was this nice little report about all of the earthquakes that had just been taking place under Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, and Mount Hood. I thought, man, I should give it an extra week before I head back up there just to see, right? You know, after we moved to Portland and bought a house, I began 
looking and, and seeing, oh, there's, there's news that in the next 50 years, there's going to be a huge earthquake off the coast, and it's going to send a tidal wave that's going to, you know, consume Portland. And all of these, these, um, all these news headlines about the natural disasters that are taking place in our world are part and parcel of what it means that humanity has broken covenant with God. We see the evidence that the world is, is a, a messed up, difficult place. The way the, the writer here will describe it, he says that creation itself is groaning, like, oh, how much more can I bear? And creation itself, the land we live on, is waiting to be delivered. Now, this continues verse 20, 22. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. And he says, we look around at the world and it's evident that the world itself needs to be delivered. But it's not just like we're talking about the land out there. But we look in our own bodies and we say our own bodies need deliverance. I was planting seeds the other day. And I was putting, uh, I think it was fava beans, big honking seeds. I was planting those in the soil and I just decided rather than digging a little one-inch hole I would just, and dropping the, the bean in and covering it, I thought, I will just press it in with my thumb. I will just put the seed on the soil and press it. I did that about 10 days ago. And occasionally I pop my thumbs like this. I just go like that and pop my thumb. And I've been doing that to this one and I go, man, that still hurts. Because after planting 15 fava beans, I strained my thumb somehow. I'm a young man. Last night when I went to bed, I got a big pillow and I stuck it under my knees so that my back would feel better in the morning. I'm 33. Yeah, get used to it, right? That's it. Life becomes more and more complicated. You know, my parents are, are approaching retirement age and my brother, who's a physician, is saying, don't get a two-story, get a ranch. You got it, right? Because you're living this. It's not just that creation and the land is in need of deliverance, but our own bodies are in need of deliverance. And, and the Apostle Paul says, we're loved, and all the while, though, we endure groaning in our spirits because we look around and we say, this isn't what God intends it to be, but one day, he's going to make all things new. He's going to make us new, and he's going to make the creation new. And we're going to live in that beautiful new creation. We're going to live in covenant with God in the land that he's recreated. But the point the apostle makes is that if, if we are hoping for this, the very fact that we have hope about it means that it hasn't happened yet. Because if it already happened, we wouldn't have to hope for it. We would just appreciate it. And so the way in which now we live out this covenant relationship with God when it comes to the land is that we look at our own bodies and we look at the brokenness of the world around us and we hold hope in the midst of deep suffering. We look at personal tragedy and physical ailment and physical disease and we see all these evidences that we live in a broken planet and we look toward God and we say, one day you will make all things new. One day I will live in a land where no inhabitant will say, I am sick where no one will grieve the loss of a loved one and where no one will grieve because through some natural disaster, life has been lost. One day, all things will be restored. And so the first way in which we experience this, this strand of the covenant as we live now in this broken world is we look in hope to the time in which Jesus will make all things new. Can you say amen? Now, the second strand comes up really powerfully in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Romans 10, I'm going to start in verse 1. If you've got that, just go ahead and say amen. Awesome. Now, in Romans 9, Paul begins this discussion about if the family of God includes people that aren't Jewish and it includes people that are Jewish, then what do we do with all these people that are ethnically Jewish but they don't have faith in Jesus. 
And in this discussion in Romans 9 through 11, Paul is moving through and he's saying God is still faithful to people that are Jewish that haven't received Jesus as their Savior, and God hasn't abandoned them, but God is trying to lead them to come to a faith experience in Jesus. And so in Romans 10 then, Paul describes this family of God that's being created by what Jesus has done, and notice how he starts it off, Romans 10 and verse 1. He says, brethren, brothers. So from the very get-go, he's writing to people that he's never met before, in another country, and he calls them brothers. And this gives us a strong indicator already that as Paul experiences this covenant relationship with God, he's got a new family that consists of people he's never met before. And his heart is filled with warmth toward them. And so he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And so he goes on now and he describes the plight of Israel. And skip with me down to verse uh, 8. Verse 8, he begins to define really what's at the heart of this family relationship. And he says, uh, verse 9 actually, he says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You say amen to that. I mean, that's, that's just at the very heart of, of the gospel, that condensed vision. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, he says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And notice his implication. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, Now notice this this is earth-shatteringly powerful. Verse 12, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so when Paul's thinking, okay, who's the family of God? Is it just ethnic Israel and their past? He says, no, God hasn't rejected them. But the way in which people come into covenant relationship with God, whether they're Jew or they're Gentile, whether they're Greek, whether they're free, whether they're slave, whether they're male, whether they're female, whether they're educated, uneducated, it doesn't make any difference. But the way that people come into covenant saving relationship with God is by faith in Jesus. And so so for Paul then, when we live in covenant with God, our family is radically transformed because all who have faith in Jesus whether they look like us or not, are part of the same family. Now, this final notion of blessing. In chapters 12 through 16, Paul really spells this out, and we don't have time to get into it in depth, but I just want to take just a a flash of a survey here. Paul says, because we experience the blessing of God as members of his covenant family, we're responsible to steward that blessing Not to keep it to ourselves, but to share it with others. And so Paul says, if you're experiencing the blessing of God, then be a blessing to those around you. And he lists several specific spheres in which that takes place. In Romans 14, verse 1, he says, Romans 14, verse 1, he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. So he says, you find someone that doesn't understand Scripture as clearly as you and so has, has conscientious um, objections to certain things that Scripture doesn't condemn. He says, receive that person, but not just to argue with them. You know, eat with them, get to know them, but not just for the sake of making your point. Actually love them. Uh, in verse, uh, chapter 14, verses 12 and 14. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. What does it mean to experience the blessing of God? It means don't do things that mess up your your brothers. Don't do things that mess up other people. Make sure that you're living, asking the question, is what I'm doing a blessing to those around me? Not just focused on myself. Uh, Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. 
We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. He says, if you're experiencing the covenant relationship with God by faith in Jesus, then bear with those who are weak. Don't try to please yourself. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, for even Christ did not please himself. And so he says the way that this covenant then is lived out is by blessing others. It's by not trying to please ourselves. It's by trying to please others. And this continues. Romans chapter 13. I wish we had time. Paul says, how do you relate now as as part of this covenant family? How do you relate to the government? Be in subjection to the government. Be an obedient citizen because you're living out the blessing. You're passing on the blessing. And so Paul's vision then is that as we experience renewed relationship with God by trusting in what Jesus has done, our worlds are transformed. We hope for the deliverance of our bodies and for this physical earth one day. We look around and we find new brothers, new sisters, new family, and we live by the Spirit that dwells in us to increasingly become a blessing to those who are far from God. I love how he's going to put this in the end of Romans 15. Paul is going to say, I want to come and visit you at Rome, and I will stay with, there, stay with you there and be refreshed, and you will partner together with me as I seek to go and sh- share the gospel in Spain. So Paul views then his blessing of knowing God as an opportunity then to travel halfway around the world to share that blessing with people who are far from God. Hoodview Church, this is our privilege to live out this covenant. It's our great honor to hope that God will make all things new. To look around at all the different faces in here and say, this is our family. Doesn't matter what your color is. Doesn't matter how how big your tax bill is because of how much you made. Doesn't matter how many letters go after your name because of all the years you spent in school. Everyone here is family by faith in Jesus. And because we're family, we look and we say, how can we bless others? How can we bless people here? How can we bless the community that's around us of of people who are far from God? I want to end by taking an opportunity to listen to Romans chapter 12. And uh, I want to encourage you to make a commitment to read Romans chapter 12 every day this week and to pray a simple prayer and say, God, live this out in my life. So, The idea that's expressed there, I think, is really beautifully captured by N.T. Wright when he says God's salvation is not simply God's gift to his people, but God's gift through his people. God sets us in right relationship with himself so that we can extend covenant relationship to others, so that other people can come to know the joy and peace of knowing Jesus. And so now we'll take a trip. It'll take about three minutes through Romans chapter 12. I think you'll be blessed by it, and I want to encourage you to commit to read it every day this week and to pray the simple prayer, God, live this out in my life. Here we go. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. 
he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's an awesome privilege and opportunity to be part of God's covenant family. Leads to specific ways that we live as a demonstration of what God is doing. And so today, if you're someone that's come, and we've had a lot of this in our congregation recently, someone who's suffering, someone who's going through difficult times, who's looking around at pain, who's experiencing it in your own body, today I would just want to humbly say, have hope that the God who's redeemed you will one day restore you. Have hope that the God who's made you and who loves you will one day make all things new. For those of you who now live as part of God's family because you've professed faith in Jesus, I want to encourage you, I want to beg you to hold your brother and to hold your sister in the highest esteem, to speak well of them, to, to hold up their reputation, to live to be a blessing to them, to not seek opportunity to assert your own way or to get your own way but to seek to restore broken relationships, to seek to mend difficulties and strained relationships, to seek to reunite as much as is possible God's family here. And finally, a call to extend the family of God. I want to encourage you to give yourself over for a longing for those who are far from God. Give yourself over to a desire to see those who are far from God be connected with him and part of his family. I tell you what, there are people who walk in the doors here of this congregation, walk in the doors of this, this building, who are far from God and have come here because their spirit uh, is stirred up about something. And it might just be that, that someone has made them come and they don't want to be here. There are other people that, that are coming here because they just have this sense that they need to have a relationship with Jesus. And so they show up here and I want to beg you and urge you to continue to have the deepest concern that these people be connected with God's family. There are faces in this room, if we look around, there are faces that we recognize, but we don't know them. And so I want to encourage you to, to take this as a call, as a challenge, to walk across the room and to, to introduce yourself to someone whose name you don't know. And that face has a story. And so I want to invite you to learn that story, to hear how God is part of their journey, and to live to be a blessing to them. There are people in your family that are far from God, and maybe today is the day that God is calling you to, to give a phone call and to say, you know what? 
It's been difficult, but I've chosen to forgive you because that's what God in Jesus has done for me. There are broken family relationships that could be restored by extending this grace through a simple phone call saying, I forgive you. You have a coworker that you've worked with whose life may be a wreck, who doesn't know Jesus. Find ways to win their confidence and to lead them to know Jesus as their Savior. There are many here who could be giving more to support frontier ministry work. So I want to encourage you. Maybe God's putting a burden on your heart to extend his family by giving more sacrificially, by saying no to yoga a couple times and saying yes to a missionary. I was recently um, speaking with a friend who has a daughter that's had a really difficult time with life and uh, ended up getting married at about 20 to a guy that was just no good for her and the family said, this guy's no good for you. And so over the course of about three years, she found herself divorced from this guy and in a relationship with a drug dealer who is currently serving time in San Quentin prison. And um, it seemed like she was just lost in outer darkness. And I was speaking with the mom, and she was just describing her journey of, of having this daughter who's far from the family of God. She said, we didn't know what to do. So finally, we got together and we made an intervention scrapbook. And so we wrote down in this book, you know, to our daughter, to our sister, from your friends, from your family, come back to God. Come back to God. She described to me how this, her daughter's younger brother, at 15 years old, wrote a letter that touched her heart. And when she read that, it just, when the daughter read this letter from her brother, it just lodged in her heart and she, she's had this sense that I want to come back to God and I don't know how to do it. So she found herself in the car with her boyfriend, this drug dealer who's now in prison for terrible crimes. And she didn't know how to get out without losing her life. She didn't know, because she knew too much and she didn't know how to get out of this situation. But she was convicted and God used this intervention scrapbook as a, as a means to reach her heart and she just prayed this simple prayer and said, God, I want out of this. Within the hour, she found herself participating in a high-speed chase away from the police and a car crash. And this guy got out of the car and fled and was caught by a police dog and, and is now in prison. And she found herself arrested. And for her, being arrested was her moment of deliverance. God wants us to extend the blessing of being part of his family, to be creative. But there are people who he's placed in your path and he's saying, these are my kids. Please, please, please bring them home to me. I want to invite you to join with me as we sing our closing hymn. We'll invite the song team up now. It's a beautiful hymn. One of the things I love about it is it celebrates that Jesus is crowned king, not just of the Jews, not just of the Gentiles, but of all people. And so I want to invite you to stay seated as the deacons will come forward now and collect our offering for the day. And then we'll invite you after the deacons have collected the offering. You guys can go ahead and come forward. Um, then we'll invite you to stand up as we sing the remaining verses.